All right, welcome everyone. My name is Lynn and I am the co-founder and COO of Layer CI. First off, thanks to the awesome engineering team at Welcome, the creators of this awesome platform for sponsoring this event. Y'all rock. Um, and of course, thanks to the audience um, for coming and we'll be leaving some time at the end to answer a couple of questions. So feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A section in the chat um, and we'll answer the questions at the end. So this event that you're coming to today is on how to be a good developer. Very vague, but given the awesome and unique perspectives from for developers turned founders, um, this is a really good opportunity to ask some of the burning questions and get those answered. They're currently working on developer-focused companies. However, in their past lives, they've really seen the best and worst practices as engineering leaders too. So um, here's a quick intro on everybody who's on stage right now. We've got Ahmad, who is the ex-CTO of NPM and co-founder of Core. We've got Kyle, who is the founder of CTO.ai. We've got Sankate, the co-founder of Deep Source. And we've got my co-founder, Colin, who is the CEO of Layer CI. So welcome, everyone. So before we get started, speakers, Here's the opportunity to share a little bit more about what you're building at your respective companies and a little bit more about what kinds of things you'll be talking about, whether it's the startup level, the mid-market level, or the enterprise level in terms of developer team sizes. So let's start with Ahmed. OK. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ahmed Asri. Um, like, like Lynn mentioned, I'm currently co-founding a company called Core. Uh, we're focusing on trying to accelerate uh, development and uh, technology ideation and solutioning for uh, integration level problems in uh, SaaS uh, marketplaces and SaaS companies. Uh, primarily, what that means is a lot of fancy words for there's a lot of solved problems out there that a lot of developers have to spend a lot of time and money and effort into. And we're trying to accelerate developers and teams of developers so that they can fast forward through these kind of pro solved problems and get to working on the parts of their product and technology that is uh, actually the thing that they're coming out to build or the focus of what the company sells and offers. Awesome. Let's go, Kyle. Hey everyone, Kyle uh, founded CTO.ai, and we are trying to advance the future of what we call low-code DevOps. Uh, we think a lot of the infrastructure and technology that we use as software developers has gotten far more complicated than ever before, especially relative to the, the talent uh, that is available to businesses. And so what we're trying to do is help companies focus on delivering awesome applications, uh, not you know robust uh, lead building operations from first principles. What's different about us is we sort of put data at the center of our platform. Uh, we sort of an event driven platform, but we also do a lot to measure uh, the delivery stream of software projects, uh, measure key metrics like lead time for change, deployment frequency, these sorts of things to help uh, drive sponsorship for development teams who want to further invest into the, into the tools that they have uh, in their team. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, let's go Sankate. Hey, hi everyone! Thanks for joining in. I'm uh, Sanket, uh, co-founder of DeepSource. Uh, at DeepSource, we are building an automated code review tool that helps developers write good code. So you could think of uh, DeepSource as Grammarly, but for software developers. Uh, so we use static analysis and a bunch of other technologies, uh, and not only detect problems in your code, but automatically help you fix them as well in a couple of clicks. And uh, it's free for open source. So yeah, feel free to use it. Thanks, Sankey. Okay, Colin, bring us home. What's Layer CI? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Colin. I'm the you know co-founder and CEO of Layer CI, uh, and our tool is kind of the newest generation of CI products. We're helping people uh, not just run unit tests, but also set up their entire you know front end, back end uh, database for every commit, so that they can uh, give demos to their first customers or to their coworkers. Uh, they can share with QA people. They can run end-to-end -end tests. And generally, we just help people, you know, make sure that their code is good every time uh, one of their teammates pushes changes, instead of, uh, you know, asking QA people at the end of the week to look at what you've done. Awesome. All right. Thanks everyone for taking the time to do a quick intro. Let's go into a speed round of three different topics. First one's going to be on technical debt horror stories, common mistakes that people 
uh, make at you know each level of growth. Second is on how to hire great developers, how to retain great developers, and you know when is the time to let someone go. Um, Topic number three is how to be a good leader in general. So I'll let you guys take your spin on that. Um, so let's go to topic number one first, technical debt. Off of it, what do you think? Um, I hear it's a thing. I don't know. My, my code is perfect. I never have technical debt, so I don't know about you. Uh, <laughs> I think it's just it's a, it's a nature of building software that and, and in the context of a business. Uh, the business priorities change, the product evolves, the customer base, you know, has different needs at different maturity levels. So the thing that you build on day one uh, may not be the same shape or the same implementation um, or even exist at day 100 and day 300. Um, and along with that comes, you know, the code that you wrote to make that thing happen, to make that feature happen. Uh, it in itself might have so many hooks into your platform or your, or your, or your other pieces of code that it forces you down a path of either making short-term decisions with long-term impact, uh, and that long-term impact becomes what we refer to as technical debt, uh, or you end up, you know, over-investing in certain pieces of technology or certain aspects of, of your platform that you become specialized in a certain area or functionality, uh, and then your business pivots or your product pivots, and all of a sudden you have to learn a whole new thing, and that's also a form of of a technical debt, that your, your expertise no longer match what you're producing. Um, but that's kind of a general definition area. I think from if you're a learner or if you're somebody getting into the industry or kind of growing within the industry, um, it's important to realize like there's a lot of tech articles and blog posts about technical debt and you know uh, how to avoid it and how to do this and do this and that and don't do this, and do this instead. And it's just there's no avoiding technical debt as nature of growth and as nature of evolution of software. Um, but there are practices and methodologies and ways of thinking that you can mitigate the risk and mitigate dealing with it. Um, and and that's, an, that's an everlasting investment that you do for yourself and for your team and for your business um, that, you know, it should be part of your software development life cycle and your software, uh, your team, your team's process of building software. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. And Kyle, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll try to build on top of what, what Ahmed's saying is I agree with everything. I, I think of almost everything in software as a dichotomy, and it's sort of a dichotomy between any two things you want to imagine, simplicity and complexity, like early stage, later stage. Things evolve and change, and like the definition of business success is your environment should be evolving faster than, frankly, your product is. And if that's happening, then it's healthy to have technical debt. What I think is unhealthy in, in engineering teams is sometimes we focus so much on technical debt um, instead of how do we mitigate the risk of technical debt. And I think that's where we lose sight of the end game of what we're trying to do with building these software products, which is either you know serve the business, serve the customer ultimately, um, or, you know, or or maybe solve a set of problems where you know frankly we're down some rabbit hole trying to solve something, and you know it's not what we started up trying to solve. I think things that help me. Um, with this is to really be conscious of the stage I'm in. And if you join a later stage, you're obviously going to you know, have to tackle more of that debt that's been accrued. But if you join the earlier stage, I think what you want to be able to do is accept and tolerate more, more technical debt. And the way, because I specialize more in the early stage, although I spent a lot of time at the later stage as well, what I try to do at the early stage is, is think about things in, in a little bit of an extreme format, which is like, I try to not build anything that I'm not willing to throw it and rebuild. And uh, and if I feel like I could throw it out and rebuild it quicker the second time, then I feel like whatever approach I took is solving the problem and advancing the learning, uh, the R&D, the research and development that actually like drives that forward without accruing technical debt. But it's a hard thing to manage as you get lots of developers. And so I think developing some sort of culture around how you, you manage it, the cadence, like talking openly about the risk you're willing to accept from 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 these things, uh, I think it's really healthy because it helps people to calibrate into the same zone. And um, you know, I think it's kind of like the you know what people will say of like a physics mindset. You know, start from first principle, look for negative feedback. But if your approach is to start with first principles and try to build for the long term, well, you know, you're ultimately going to fail. Uh, so the kind of positioning I take with the teams I work with is, you know, focus on doing the right things. Don't worry so much about doing it right. Uh, as long as you feel like you can rebuild it and you've learned from the process, then that's a, a big win for us. And, and you know, we'll have your back when it comes to trying to rebuild that functionality, um, you know, and we'll give you the feedback you need to know when the right time to do that is. 
Yeah, awesome for sharing. Thanks for doing that. Um, Sankit, do you want to add some color to this as well? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, I'm going to take a different, uh, you know, a different track uh, than what Emma and Kyle, uh, Kyle said, and talk more about uh, good coding practices because that's what I live for. Um, so when it comes to technical debt, I think a lot of things uh, also depend on when, especially when you're in the in the very early stages, is uh, adopting some of these practices that can help you at least avoid uh, a lot of things that that create the risk of accumulating or accruing technical debt. Right, say, and and some of these things are really simple, like you know, adopting uh, good code review guidelines, right? And you know, a, a lot of technical that can just accrue if you are not doing your code reviews properly. If people are just you know, LGTM, and 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 you know, and not really looking at stuff. Uh, and this is like a different track. So you know, there are a lot of things which are like the low hanging fruits. You know, adopt adopt a coding coding guideline, uh, adopt a style guideline early on, and you know, uh, you know. If, if, if you want to write documentation, uh, start writing documentation systematically, st start tracking documentation systematically. I know it's like, you know, it's easier said than done, but, uh, you know, these are the, some of those things which, uh, which are the objective part of technical debt when it comes to bad code and not really in terms of the trade-offs. And this is the reason why I said it's a different track, but I think some of these early things that you can systemize in your engineering team, uh, you can document, maybe systemize uh, some code review guidelines, some things that you want to do, keep on doing, and then really stick to that. Uh, and, and these things can really help you avoid a lot of pain as you know you add more developers in the team, as, as you add new developers who might not have the context of the your, your early five or 10 engineers and, and understand where they come from, yeah. But what I love about your suggestion is I think one of the things you're speaking to is how tools can actually create that culture and it actually gives people that that comfort level of knowing like what's within the range of tolerance that we're willing to accept in this in this culture. Uh, and I think that's how you then, like you said, scale it. It's, it's a really great way to think about it. Do you know of any tool that does that, Kyle? Hmm. I mean, I think there's lots of tools that do that. I mean, I think one of the first tools that did it was uh, Ruby on Rails. Uh, you know, probably, you know, uh, Sinkeet's tool sounds like it does that. I think everybody's trying to solve this to a certain degree, right? Uh, yeah. I was leading in to like for you to prop up CTO <laughs> CTO AI, but anyways. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I like, I like, I think we've all also, and what we just what talked and mentioned, I think we were talking about, you know, avoidance and tolerance and dealing with um for like a new team or a team that's starting or a team that's kind of like you know midway through their journey but i think it's also important to recognize that there's a whole industry and i do mean a whole industry of systems and services and products and tools and consulting and providers that deal with the long-term effect of technical debt to the point where you know when you talk about enterprise which you know spend a decent amount of my time doing enterprise things with enterprise teams with you know big kind of uh, scope and it's it's you could uh, you could see yourself literally join a company join a team and spend a whole career just untangling somebody else's technical debt from 10 15 years ago uh, and and that's a very real scenario and that's a very real environment that a lot of developers are dealing with and living through and potentially getting frustrated and burnt out by um I think there's two categories of software industry in that sense. There's the, you know, the enterprise, so to speak, uh, when, when, when you're looking from this context of like people who come in and just deal with the systems at hand and trying to untangle it and trying to kind of keep it alive or sustain it or maintain it. And then there's the, uh, the folks who want to build new things and, you know, innovative stuff and change the way things are built. And from the enterprise perspective, um, there's, there's also a vested interest in keeping things as they are because of that industry, right? When you have consultants and service providers and infrastructure systems and, and all these things put in place, there's a bit of the uh, uh, kind of, uh, I forgot the term for it, but like there's a bias towards not changing things. Um, so the, the work becomes repetitive and becomes sustaining of the, the technical debt as the function of the job and people lose sight of it's being labeled as technical debt. They just see it as, well, this is just the way things are. This is just how things are built. Um, and that's, you know, that's a challenge for anybody who's trying to change things or anybody who's trying to keep the, um, uh, you know, the team motivated and the team kind of actually productive. Uh, but that's also a challenge for developers and careers, right? Because most 
by quantity, <laughs> most of the hiring happens in these large enterprise businesses where there's a lot of this technical debt and there's a lot of these kind of uh, keeping the lights on mode of work as opposed to learning new things and building new stuff and exploring new patterns of building software. And, and it, it creates a little bit of a bias to or a separation between what you see on Twitter and what you see in you know cool articles on dev.to or any of those kind of like uh, techie websites and, and things where where versus what you're actually dealing with day to day on your job. Um, so it's important for people to kind of see that disconnect and also recognize where they can be more effective uh, and or how to take the lessons from the shiny object syndrome with the start startup world where it's like building new things all the time and actually rationalizing that into, into internal kind of value or a lesson to be learned or something to adopt internally to kind of mitigate the technical debt uh, mountain that you're probably dealing with. I uh, I wanted to talk a bit about like the the benefits of technical debt because I, I think a lot of the conversation has been like you know you've inherited a big code base you know you're working on you're working in a team as like an intermediate developer you know there's like bad docs you have like a, a lot of spaghetti and like you're you're trying to you know deal with that mountain um, but in the early days technical debt's really useful as just like you know the same way debt is useful in in real life like. Um, for example, when, when we got our first customer at Layer, we didn't have a log out button. You could only log in and you couldn't log out. Because you know, before you have users, there's no reason to have a log out button. So we, you know, I we did the logic for logging in, and then there was a to-do add log out logic. And that's technical debt, right? That's like uh, something you're not, you know, it's like a feature you know your users will eventually need, but there's no reason to make it before you know it's needed. Um, and there's lots of these little decisions in, in technology. Uh, if you're making a product that you don't know will be a runaway success, or a product that you don't know users will use in the way you're imagining it to be built, if you over-engineer things, you're just wasting your own time. Because you, you know, like Kyle said, you might just have to throw it out anyways. So it's really useful to think like, what's the bare minimum I can do? How many slash slash to do full colon hack can I put in my code to get people to use it? Um, and then once they're using it, they'll tell me when they need the features. And then you know you you look you control F to do hack or you hire someone, you work with uh, a developer on your team and you say like you know search the code base for to do hack, uh, those need to be solved, and then just like try to try to find out if these features are actually needed. So in, in the early days, especially for personal projects and like startups, that that sort of thing is really useful for getting started. I love that. Like I I have an ex a fairly extreme mindset about it because for me it's how lean can I keep things because it's sort of I'm managing that dichotomy and that eventual pull that perpetual pull towards complexity and technical you know accruing technical debt. So the the way that I typically phrase this and and I don't know that everyone loves this but uh, you know I, I see this come up all the time with but it won't scale and my answer is always good. That's a, that's a good problem to have. If we have to handle that problem then we're on the right track but let's not worry about it before we solve these other four or five problems. And somebody in the audience kind of asks, like, when do you know what the right time is? The approach I try to do is think about it a little bit through a product sense. So like a logout button is a good example of like how you might, you're kind of looking at also from a product stance. And in product um, management, there's what's called an ICE score, which is just impact plus confidence divided by effort. And if you can do that for everything, you're kind of setting a framework for how you think about the things that are gonna have the highest impact, lowest risk. Uh, and then you can prioritize pretty accordingly as well and then that gives you a sense of like how much debt are we actually accruing over time uh, because you know if there's a high impact and low effort um, that's that's good a good place to be I, I want to be the contradictory person for a second um, and I won't take too much time uh, but the, uh, I like that Colin mentioned the logout button example because that's something everybody ends up having to deal with and building, you know, your login, your logout, your user flows, your, you know, email welcome button and your notifications and so on. Um, I see those things as extremely neg negative technical debts because these are solved problems. Like these are not things that any of us should be building anymore. Um, and, and I mean, you know, spoiler alert, that's what core is out to solve. Um, uh, and the company that I'm co-founding. Um, but those are the things that there's enough patterns in the industry that a little bit of upfront research um, helps you at least find the the blueprint, the roadmap, the 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 map, if you mean like just a physical map of like, well, here's the route I'm gonna go. Okay, great. I know that there is a route. I know that there is a way. I know there is a standard. I know there is a process. I know there is an implementation detail. 
uh, I can deviate from the route as many times as I want, or as as uh, or I can just not take the route, like Kyle said. Like those things help you, and 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 it's you know to the benefit of an early startup kind of conversation. Um, but knowing that there's a route also avoids you going and building, making your own path, because making your own path is technical debt, especially for those things that are not essential to your business. One of the things that I always instill on all my development teams is. Uh, this kind of like one liner of we should only build things that only we can build and and that login is not one of those things uh you know your your deployment infrastructure is not one of those things your your kubernetes configuration is not one of those things um you should you should always seek to build the things that are unique to your product to your team to your company uh, because otherwise everything else is either a need or a, or, or a com appliance or a vendor tool or a SaaS product you're kind of leverage. Uh, so if you find yourself building or coding or integrating those things and spending a lot of time in that, that is what you know actual technical debt looks like. And you're probably never going to visit that. Or more importantly, you're never going to become the expert in it. Your, your, your company is dedicated towards a certain product kind of category or a certain functionality. You're not going to be the best at how to store user passwords or how to, uh, you know, send the best emails or do those kind of things. That is not your, you know, your reason for existing as a team as a company. Uh, so that also means that you're never going to have the time to come back and address that technical debt because the budget is never going to be allocated to that. The priority will never be the top priority. It's always going to be there and it's always going to hurt you. Um, or if not hurt you, at least bug you, <laughs> and you know just like all that code and all that stuff just sitting there. So you know, recognizing where to invest your time and recognizing where to do the right thing is also a factor of um, you know what is and isn't technical debt and you know how you can even address it. Yeah, Dan McKinley once said, "Choose boring technology. You've got three innovation tokens. Don't spend them on things that aren't your your special sauce." Nice. That's actually a great transition into the next topic, which is what is a good developer, right? What What is a good developer hire at each level of development? I've met, talk, talked about a little bit of, you know, uh, it, it looks a lot different on the enterprise level versus, you know, um, just the idea of, you know, going with your core competency. So let's continue with that conversation. Ahmed, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, an enterprise size company is one that has it's it's you know usually referred to by the, their market size right not necessarily their team member size you can be a team of five people and still be an enterprise company um, that's not it's not the team size or the, or the function of, of how your engineering is built uh, but typically speaking it's like companies that have hundred or more developers uh, or a development team as part of a bigger even bigger team like sales and marketing and everything else so you know like uh, the 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 differences in the enterprise context or large team context at that scale, it's where you're no longer having a personal connection to every team member. Um, you don't go and you know you can't just like tap somebody on the shoulder and talk to them. You know even in a physical non-pandemic world, um, and your your even your introduction to the technology is not something that will happen like in a and that day or two where you can sit down and share some code and look over together with whoever's helping you figure it out, it's going to take you six months before you're ready to even understand the full scope of things, if at all. Um, so your developer journey coming into that uh, large scale team, whether you're a junior, intermediate, senior, whatever level you might be in, uh, looks completely different than like joining a startup or joining a mid-sized company uh, where you know, you can get onboarded fast, you can have a personal connection relationship with the team members, and you can actually get your knowledge up to speed um, to how you can be productive and effective. The reason those three things matter is because, you know, whether it's months down the road or years down the road, when you want to make a technology change or make a suggestion or introduce a, a, a kind of challenge to the way things were, were implemented or an architecture solution, um, you have to have a personal relationship. You have to figure out, you know, if your body of knowledge encapsulates all the areas that you're suggesting to change or wanting to uh, touch on, uh, and you need to know who to talk to. Uh, so that could take you years before you can actually feel productive, before you can actually feel that you're um, part of a company and you know making an impact and, and doing things and actually understand the whole scope of things. And for the people hiring, um, they're not hiring for 
you know a, a, a year or two of employment they're thinking of we're gonna we're gonna bring you in and you're gonna build your career here uh, basically spend the next five to ten years in this company um, at least those are just the good ones the smart ones because that's that's the expectation uh, I've seen a lot of bad companies you know I don't know say telecoms and say maybe some members of the chat might be and some working in some telecoms here where you know it's a rotating door where they they just think of people as cogs in the machine and they hire people in and they think oh we'll just hire a developer what's our stack oh you know ruby node whatever okay let's put that on a resume put it out there and bring somebody in that person is not going to be successful you don't have the support structures within an enterprise team like that for you to actually land successfully and grow successfully because like i said it's going to take you months before you can even feel productive so if the hiring team or the people putting out the hiring, the kind of job descriptions have not facilitated those support mechanisms, that kind of la soft landing for a team member. And, and if you if you see that going in, uh, then like run away, <laughs> don't, don't go in <laughs> because you're gonna end up spending a lot of your own personal energies trying to get to that level of, of balance and, and connectivity. And that will take months. Um, so there's like there's two sides here. There's like the hiring side. There's the employee side. Uh, but like I just wanted to put out that there. We can discuss some more. But those are kind of like the entry level for me. Of does the company know how to hire people at scale, and are the people's expectations of joining a big large enterprise team the same as uh, are they are the expectation actually clear to what that would look like? Because it's not the same as what a startup would be or a medium sized team would look like. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I mean, I think stage appropriateness is super important. Uh, and I think that's kind of what I hear Ahmed saying. And, and the way I think about this, again, because I spend most of my time in the earlier stage, um, I really kind of like think of technology experience or tools that you know, like any of that. Like to me, that's table stakes. I, I'll look for a little bit of overlap in like, hey, do you use these types of languages? Are you familiar with like Linux? Is that your preference? Because it kind of informs me the the influences and the environments that you've spent your time around, but I don't spend I don't spend a lot of time like playing any credence to the idea of like algorithms or binary. Like I dropped out of high school when I was sixteen, guys. Like I don't know any of that stuff, and I've built a successful career. I just fundamentally believe that if you're hungry and you're curious and you're a constant learner, like you'll learn that. So what I go and look for are people who kind of like exhibit the kinds of thinking that I think is going to be appropriate. And the way I think of it is sort of infinite thinking versus finite thinking game theory, where if you have a zero sum relationship with your solution, um, you're going to fail more often than you're going to succeed because it's either success or failure and like that's it, right? But if you look at your problem as sort of through this infinite lens of like how can I maneuver around it? What variables can I change? You sort of like that algorithmic approach. I just believe that those types of people will inevitably be right and inevitably be successful. And it's only a question of how much time and money I have to support them with, right? So I look for those people who are gonna, I know they're gonna get there no matter what. They're looking through me at the end of the, you know, at the problem and they're seeing like 50 different possibilities and they have like a troubleshooting type mentality for how they're going through it. Uh, and I expect that they're gonna Google every second step. So would I. Uh, and, and then the other thing is I, I do is I sort of like, I look for confidence in that, right? And I look for someone who's able to build their confidence in their solution based on how much information that they've been able to pull. And if they're able to come to me by the end of that process and go, hey, I'm super confident about this. And like, it's, I'm confident about it as well. Then I know that we're gonna work well together and I know that they're gonna work well with that team. And I think those soft skills for how people will communicate those things, how they think, um, and therefore the decisions they make um, and, and the impact of those decisions, I think those are really underrated in most uh, most interviews, especially in like the bigger, you know, fang type companies. Um, you know, I, I would never sit down and do like an algorithmic interview with somebody because it, it, it tells me the exact opposite of what I want to know. I want to know, are you like a lifelong learner who's tenacious at problem solving and ultimately is confident that you'll find the answer in, in the uh, in the end? And the other thing I will tell people is I'm like, you and I start every problem the same. It's like, we don't know the answer. I might have Googled 10,000 more things than you, uh, but like, I also don't pay a lot of credence to like how senior you are versus how junior you are, because I think you can like acquire experience quite quickly. And so I just look for density of experience in the subject matters because it's helpful to develop that confidence, which will allow someone to perform quickly. And, and that quick uh, pace of delivering will then build their confidence, help them deliver more 
gel them more with the team. And, and I think that's like, I hate to use the word synergy, but like that's kind of like how these things turn into magic, right? Yeah, it makes sense, makes sense. I'm curious actually, where does everybody hire? Like I hear people say they hire on Twitter. Like, is it about <laughs> slotting in the DMs? It's, where do you hire? So, uh, uh, so, you know, so the biggest uh, source of uh, hiring for us has uh, surprisingly been our jobs page on our website. And, and we have, especially for developers, as in, and we have the, uh, you know, uh, we, we, have a, we, have, we have the privilege of being in front of developers all the time. So uh, we do see a lot of developers coming to our jobs page and applying through directly through the, and, and we've, we've kind of tried a bunch of uh, different channels like AngelList and LinkedIn and, and a bunch of other places, Twitter DMs, of course. Um, but so far, and we have a small team, we have a 23 developer team, uh, uh, and, and I think most of the people, either they have come directly uh, through our website or they have been referred by someone in the team already who was working. And I, I think I think you know we have much more affinity towards people who who are uh, you know who have been referred by other people in the team because that also you know acts like a, a proxy for trust, and and that is super critical uh, for us because you know especially and you know adding to adding to the uh, point that uh, Kyle mentioned uh, in, in things that uh, to look for when you're hiring right like of course like you know if you're if you're really looking for uh, people who are good at algorithms, you're basically looking for different signals. They're, these are basically proxies for something else, right? Uh, and I think I think uh, the ability to kind of, or, or the or the want to kind of you know solve things, and and just just to you know build things, uh, even if they don't know. Like you know, some of the most successful hires that we have made, even in my previous startup, were interns who were still in college. And uh, they joined us, and they didn't. They didn't know anything, and they just really wanted to learn stuff. And then they ended up becoming the first engineer, the first full-time engineer at my startup uh, at, at Deep Source, and ended up like owning major components and and architecting architecting things from scratch. So yeah, I mean that's that that has been my experience uh, in that perspective. I, I like that because um, I mean I've I have many hiring stories I've, I've hired on linkedin on github on twitter on you name it i've hired in events and conferences i've hired in bars um literally like you name it i've hired that's mostly when you know spamming my career but like when you're hiring as well for you know uh, like one of the last enterprises i worked at i hired over 200 people in the span of a year and a half um and and you know, it depends on your your needs, obviously. But like what I was saying earlier, like with the enterprise context, like you're gonna hire somebody, you're gonna have a supporting and, and knowledge management for them and training and things that span months. You can hire faster. You can hire, you know, with less, uh, let's say, selection bias than you know what Kyle was mentioning. Like you have to like be specific. Like are these the people you're gonna want to work with for the long term? Because um, to me, one of the things as like my litmus test for developers in particular uh, is literally two questions. It's um, or it's a one. It's one question from different angles. Is does this person have uh, willingness to learn, and do they have the ability to learn? Because those are two different things. But it kind of summarizes what Carl was talking about about like, will this person be able to Google things and figure things out, and will they ask the right questions? Will they come with questions as opposed to, um, you know, just do the do the thing on their own without checking in? Um, but those things will like I have a sliding kind of uh, gate from what well, you know if I'm a team of five and starting a new company versus. You know, I'm just hiring 500 people for the next three years. Uh, to how strict I want to be about those things, because you can bring somebody in, uh, and it's better for for me if I'm an enterprise kind of level team. It's better for me to bring somebody in, see them make mistakes, help them learn through those mistakes, and then grow them, and then teach them more, and have them you know feel productive and feel happy and feel that they're actually learning something as part of that experience, as opposed to like I'm a startup of five people and somebody came in mistake and deleted the production database. Well, shit, like now we're all screwed. The other people's jobs are now on the line with a with a mistake like that. So you can't you can't have that mistake happen in an early days. Uh, so you're going to be way more selective. Um, as again, as a hiring manager, uh, I think as as a, I mean, from my own personal experience, when like there's a bias as well to like 
I think it was a ch chat was mentioned is like I want five years experience of a tool that was just launched last week when it comes to like recruiters in the job market the job market is brutal and it's not very effective at all to the point where I just stopped using recruiters altogether I, I just do all the hiring myself and the most successful channel for me has been referrals obviously because of that building relationships and training people and kind of helping them getting their first job. And now I've seen people that I've hired for their first job becomes like tech leads at companies and CTOs and others. Um, they kind of, that's like, it pays back over time that that network that you're building obviously pays back. Um, and those are the people you want to connect with, people who like have that kind of referral network. You know, if you're looking for a job right now, or if you're in the market thinking about going to a job, uh, looking for a job, going to the recruiters, going to HR is actually the wrong path. Some companies, it's the only path. And if if you're targeting that company and just want to work at a particular company, you have to go through that stupid path. Um, but if if you're more looking for that growth and that connections, find that ecosystem of network of people who have good referrals, who have a good kind of culture around growth and learning and, and sharing. And that's what you want to be part of. Uh, because even if you go to a company or a startup and it doesn't work out or it gets sold or something happens, that relationship carries with you to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Awesome. And, and before we jump into, I guess, more startup hiring, um, just to give Sanke and Colin a chance to speak on that more, um, I think people are curious about the TLDR on your bar hiring. How does that even work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mean like my selection criteria? <laughs> How did that even happen? I, I didn't realize that was an Oh, option. Oh, the bar. Um, so like the way I look at my role as a team leader, as a manager, as a CTO, it's about building a community. So it's either building a community within your company, within your team, or you know, if you're building technology tools like I have been for the my, you know, last six, seven years of my career, you're building software development tools and platforms, you have to build a community with your target customers, i.e. the software developers. So there's a good of intersect there. And a lot of it of, of what I do with that is actually doing kind of community type engagements, whether those are events and conferences and workshops and open source work and you know committee contributions and those type of things. So a lot of what I do actually ends up overlapping of when it comes to like running a team and running a company, it overlaps of doing community external work and doing um, you know internal community uh, culture building. Uh, so like I've had a number of areas where I would be in an event or I would be organizing an event or I'd be speaking at an event. Uh, there's a bar kind of conversation that happens after, or I've met people at a bar and I always have to keep that, you know, muscle going of I'm hiring, I'm building a team, I'm building a community. Is this a person I want to connect with? Is this a person I want to work for me? Is this a person I want to work for? Um, so like, Whatever you are, it's all about that network effect. So the bar story is happened, I think, three or four times where uh, I was at a, a bar after an event and you know was chatting with somebody and I'm like, I want to work with you or you're a person I would like to work with and you know here's a job I'm hiring, come on board. Um, another one was where um, I was like at a social event at a bar and a person I don't know who was at part of the group talked about what they were doing. Oh, you do the software. I do software too. Let's talk about what we're doing. And I found some good value in that conversation. Like, you know, let's take this further. Let's meet up and talk one-to-one. -one. And that ended up in that person actually, you know, coming and joining the team that I was part of. So like, as a leader, you have to be out there and doing all that kind of stuff. It's not just about a job post, hand it over the fence to HR and let HR figure it out because they're going to screw it up. Hundred. This I think this happens more common than anyone would expect. Like I've I have a, a many similar stories, and the way I think of it is just always be recruiting. Pretty much every new awesome person you meet with is a potential, and it's like you're just kind of sometimes it just especially when you're having a beer or something like it can just be like hey let's work together, and it just happens. In, in my previous startup, we uh, we had a really uh, famous uh, uh, bar next to our office. So every every uh, two or three months, we used to have this code for beer hackathon. Uh, so we'd basically just you know post it on 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 our uh, Facebook page or something uh, that hey uh, this this Friday uh, you know afternoon for three three hours we have booked this entire floor. You come and you know we will give you beer and you hack with us. And uh, we had a bunch of people from that. So I mean it's it's this is this, this kind of works with with developers. <laughs> 
Yeah. Developers just live on beer and pizza, right? That's all they need. <laughs> <laughs> that's, if you ask an event organizer what they should do for developer events, that's all they do. It's like, oh, just make them beer and pizza. That's what developers want, <laughs> so which is not correct. But anyways. Um, I, I wanted to talk, like, I have a bit of a contrarian opinion on junior, intermediate, senior, To I guess the, the rest of the group think it's like, a, you know, like hire hungry people and they'll, they'll do well for you, which is a good plan. But I, I kind of mentally have distinctions between junior, intermediate, and senior developers. And my, I guess my internal criteria are junior developers are for things like the login button. Like, you know, they, they can set up the glue code, they can set up the, like, mundane things that are not your core focus. And your goal is for them to do mundane things, uh, have fun doing it, so that you know they'll learn the stack, they'll learn the coworkers' names, and then you can invest in them. Uh, and then you know eventually they become an intermediate developer, and it's much easier to get like long-term uh, employee retention if you can promote junior developers from that. So your goal isn't really to get like immediate uh, core product value from them; it's just to train them, make them happy, and then they convert into like very good intermediate developers that are already fully onboarded. Um, I think of intermediate developers as people that can make product decisions. You know, they can read tickets and find like you know commonalities between the tickets. Like I, I think specifically for startups, it's an easy mistake to just have people like look at the issue tracker and you know pop ticket from issue tracker, build the thing, uh, check mark, move on. So for a startup, you want an intermediate developer that uh, can see like patterns within the tickets and say like, oh, you know, people have a misunderstanding about this entire feature. Is this like maybe we should talk about this? And senior developers can, you know, uh, they can architect things. They can say, like, we need a new service to do this. We need to allocate people to, like, this project. Um, they're generally just, like, uh, you know, you don't tell them what to do. They just find valuable things to do and do them, uh, valuable things in your, your core product competency. So, like, internally, in, in our job postings, when I say, I want a junior developer, I want an intermediate developer, I want a senior developer, that's really what I'm thinking of. Um, but like a lot of companies, like as you grow, it becomes really difficult to objectively measure those things. Like you can't tell from a resume whether someone can find general patterns. Uh, so a lot of companies, uh, as they get bigger, just put it in years of experience. It's like two years of experience. Well, you know, you've probably worked enough to uh, like find general patterns. Five years of experience, you can probably figure out things on your own. Um, but uh, like I think years of experience is just a proxy for what companies actually want, which is you know, those problem solving skills or uh, lack thereof for junior developers. Because you don't expect everyone to be able to make amazing software, like right out of graduation or right out of a boot camp. Sometimes you just need people to like work on the mundane things, like the, the issues that are easily solvable, but you just can't dedicate your actual like productive developer time to. So, or even, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree uh, with that. I wanted to. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let actually, me go because I took funny. notes. I took notes. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there's so many here. We should have our own convert, whole leave different event for, for that. Leave some for me. <laughs> I'll leave some for you. But I think a couple of things, um, and then we can revisit how this might be different for startups later, but if you, uh, for enterprises later. But uh, going to market and talking about a junior developer versus an intermediate developer is the wrong signal to send like sure there's titles and there's compensations associated with titles and there's you know things that matter in that sense titles do matter um but what matters more than titles is definitions of roles and responsibilities um so what i do when i when i post jobs or kind of put together the job descriptions i focus more on the roles and responsibilities in the context of what I want you to do and what I expect from you and what I'm going to do for you and what you're going to do for me. Like describe the actual work, not the, do you know React or do you know Kubernetes or do you know this or that? Like there is no value to that. If they don't know that, who cares? They'll learn it as long as they can do the job. The job is what your expectations are of inputs and outputs of somebody's work and somebody's daily work. Um, if they don't know the tool, they'll learn it. Maybe that's part of the requirements. Great. You know, like, there is no value in going to market and saying, I want the uh, person who knows how to do React because your implementation of the tool or your implementation of the language is specific to you. So there's a learning factor that has to happen anyways. So I think the seniority conversation is a compensation one. The roles and responsibilities is what matters from an expectation setting of what you're going to be doing. And then you can take that to like, okay, well, if I'm going to expect this much out of you, here's how I map that to a compensation. Um, because obviously it will differ from 
com- country to country, team to team, uh, size of an enterprise uh, company to like an enterprise size. Um, the other one, really quick. Um, I mean, to me, a junior developer in any company, uh, their job is not to ship code. Their shop is their job is to learn code. That's it. If you're if you are a startup founder or a engineering manager or a director of engineering, and you think you can hire junior engineers to ship code, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And you're and it's junior engineers to ship code. You're shooting yourself in the foot, and you're actually costing your company money. Don't do it. Hire engineers, junior engineers, only if you can actually dedicate them to learn how to become intermediate engineers. That is their job function. Their purpose is to learn how to become intermediate. That's it. Because there's a whole cascading effect of um, cause and purpose and, 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 and mapping to even company OKRs and companies' uh, investment numbers if you think you're going to like rely on a junior engineer function uh, to actually produce work. And that's nothing to say about the junior individual themselves. It's about you and the company, how you structure your work. Um, that's kind of like been my kind of stake that I've I've fought HR departments with and fought teams with. Like, no, we're gonna hire a junior engineers so that they can be, learn to become intermediate, not because we think we can just offload work to them to ship things. Um, and that, that's just you know I can bring the receipts in terms of cost and effort and like the total impact on business and that, but really it's just a mental model as opposed to a you know a, a way of doing work. It's just a mental model to think about how you're going to treat somebody who's learning. Well, don't expect them to ship code. <laughs> they learn. That's all. That's the whole point. They're learners. Um, so, anyways, a bit of a rant, but I'm passionate about I'll, that. I'll be real sure. It's like I think these are great frameworks for how you think about it, how you communicate it to the market. But in reality, in my experience, I've seen tons of junior engineers come straight out of boot camp and outpace and over deliver on senior engineers who are too biased by the technologies that they were stuck in in the past right and so by that measure if we follow that the whole way through well that senior is a junior and that junior is a senior so uh, the way i just look at it is like stay flexible because it really comes down to the that person's ability to adapt in the environment and the more rigid you get the more structured people people feel the more comfortable they certainly will be you know based on compensation environment all these things but if you rule out that opportunity for people to become exceptional or over index on seniors where seniors certainly carry just as much bias as they do experience and sometimes you know we've been through enough uh, painful launches where we're like just no people around certain things right then, then you don't have that balance that you need and, and i think you got to keep that conversation open for um, people to be able to kind of like advance at their own pace and if you put too much structure around it it becomes a, a pecking order um, that can really dilute the uh, the creativity of the of the team. Um, so I I agree with everything you two have said. Maybe I wasn't super clear in what I was saying, but I mean, like if if your juniors are seniors and your seniors are juniors, like you you should probably like not even give an offer to the people that think they're seniors. Like in our our most recent hiring batch, there was people that claimed to be you know senior full stack developers, and based on my criteria for senior, it didn't seem like that was actually true. So I didn't extend them an offer. Uh, but there was people, yeah. but there was you know new grads that did they crushed the interview. They knew all of the fundamentals. They uh, had great personal projects. Like they'd taken ownership of things, and I gave them probably much higher than their market salary in Toronto, uh, because I wanted to retain them. Because once the market realized that value, um, they you know the their actual market title would be intermediate or senior developer. So like just because someone's a new grad, it doesn't mean they're a junior, and just because someone has ten years of experience doesn't mean they're a senior. But I think it is important to. Like make that in the job, like in the contract, and have people know yeah. like what you're hiring others for and why. Yeah, yeah. My, my just to take what you just said further and what Carlos saying, <clears throat> my ideal scenario of a a hiring and growth journey is that literally everybody starts junior, and the factor of which you progress to the level that you should be at is just a factor of how much experience and how much you can actually work within the environment and that should be for everybody like you know marketing sales anything just everybody starts a junior and let's see how far you can get in two weeks or three weeks and just keep progressing and ultimately that's how you build knowledge and learning in the team um and it's not like to downplay their skill it's not to minimize their experience it's just you know what like you, you we're, we're hiring you to be my replacement think about it that way and the faster you can get there the happier I'm going to be. So 
let's get you there if you if you start and then by the third day you're immediately like past this past past go 15 times and now you're at this senior level great i'm happy you're now a senior at day three perfect i mean that's just um a kind of pipe dream for me because it's hard to message that to an industry and how the norms of the industry and what people expect externally um but like to me that's that's how i would think about it it's like it's just it's just a journey that somebody's on and everybody should start from the same point and how good they are is a factor of how fast they can move all through all the checkpoints um so you know if, if i ever you know when I, when i hire again for a company that i fully control or like in a world that I don't have to deal with, you know, the norms of the industry, um, I would probably try to break away from uh, how that's signaled externally. I wouldn't just say what the level of the job is. I'll just say it's a job. Come, you want to you want to be part of the story. Let's be part of the story, and let's figure out how to compensate you and how to give you responsibilities that match what you can actually work on and deliver. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm gonna actually, since this is relevant, um, bring on the first question that uh, wanted to be answered. We've answered, you know, a little bit about senior developers based on what your definition is. But what are the key qualities of a good software team lead? Feel free to take this. I'll, uh, can I answer with an anecdote? So my yeah, the yeah. first company first company I joined was a startup, and uh, like the like there was like management that was like not taking care of things. So like someone was just leaving their dirty dishes in the sink, and like the sink just stank. Like the the sink of the startup, people wanted to like, you know, uh, wash their things after microwaving them and it just stank. And uh, like the CEO of the company, um, without telling anyone, just like washed the dishes and everyone just kind of like turned their heads at the, you know, at, at him doing this. And then he just went right back to work. And uh, like, you know, a couple of years later, I talked to him and I said like, at that moment, I, I wanted to stay with him at that startup. And it, it wasn't because he washed the dishes, it's because like, he just saw there was something that had to be done no one was doing it, so he like did it, and he didn't chastise anyone for like you know leaving the dishes dirty. But the, you hear this term like servant leadership bandied around, and I think that really exemplifies that like you want your team leads to be people that aren't like they're not going to just dictate from above and like tell people to do it, what to do. They'll be like you know working with the developers and they'll do distasteful things, but it'll be for the good of everyone, and people will follow them for that reason. Yeah, and, I, and, and I, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just just adding to that, I think that's a that's a beautiful uh, that's a beautiful notion, I guess. And uh, and and everything set aside, like you know, you have the technical uh, skills, and you have some of the uh, you know team management, whatever you wanna you wanna you know uh, evaluate for. But after that, I think one of the things that I personally look for, uh, you know, and we have hired a couple of team leads in the team, is how well they can really connect. Um, with uh, especially people who are coming in, you know, and and uh, kind of uh, explain to them why we are doing this, and as and when they are increasingly, you know, working in the team with other people, how well they're able to explain to them the culture, in addition to doing what a team lead does every day, right? Uh, which is getting making sure that you know things are running running perfectly, and I think the example that you know uh, that Colin said it it it. it it kind of really, really is important that hey, you need to be you know you need to be empathetic uh, and you know uh, and and connect. Yeah. Yeah, I've thought about this a lot. I think earlier on in my career, I really believed in the idea that a leader is that person who or a team lead, and, and I kind of don't like that word because it can be pretty ambiguous. But like a team lead is somebody who's like your best developer. The team trusts them, has confidence in them, and they will follow for them because they do the things that need to be done. Kind of like. The analogy you said, Colin, but I think what I've come to believe that leadership is over time, which is a key component of that that role and that term, is also the ability to reflect back the decisions of others in such a way where you're not chastising them, but you're helping them to really understand the consequence yeah. of that decision, both the benefits and, and and the negatives. And I think it requires a bit of like courage, and it's hard sometimes for software engineers to do that because we tend to want to focus more on like doing the thing and then hope people will find us follow us but at a certain point i think you also have this accountability as a leader to sort of be able to reflect back the why and it's not like a measure of making somebody like you know second guess themselves it's just a measure of helping them understand from your perspective 
you know, with all of your experience, you know, why that decision maybe was suboptimal for these reasons. And if they can internalize that and the trust is established and that radical candor is in play, I really think that that's what puts somebody on that leadership track in their career. And I think it's one of the biggest growth opportunities for most engineers. And I think more often than not, uh, engineers will choose not to go down that path because they think management. But, but I think if you think leadership, which starts with washing the dishes, but then sort of you know, continues with walking back to the desk and everyone asking themselves, well, why didn't I wash the dishes? Then I think you're really talking about leadership. And that's something where, you know, you can have an exponential impact as a software engineer, you know, 10x engineers making five people two times more effective at their job, not, you know, writing 10 times more code. Awesome. We've got so, time for, oh, go I ahead. Just wanna, I just want to like plus one on all of that. Sure. Um, and, and one of the, like I like that Kyle brought up the to topic of management because you know obviously team lead means different things in different companies because it's a title yeah. it's not a descriptive role responsibilities but yes that's what people mostly think um, I think the uh, the 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 quote that I always go back to um, is one from Grace Hopper where where she references like management and leadership in the military and it's like you know we we went so far down the path of management and and we forgot that leadership is about people so her th her quote is summarized like you manage things, but you lead people. So, you know, in a, in a context of software teams, if you're the team lead, your job is not to be the one to make decisions about how code is written or how the platform is deployed or anything like that. Your job is to help facilitate the team to make that decision. Um, your job is not to be the sign off authority on pull requests and those type of things. Your job is to help the team be able to do that better. Um, and therefore, like my my measure of it is like I want somebody to replace me if I'm the leader, if I'm the if I'm the and I want somebody to know enough and be compassionate enough and know the team and know the technology enough that they can just do that as well. Um, so like it's a growth mechanism for your team members. That's your job is to help them grow, help them learn, help them help them be productive. Awesome. We've got time for one more question. Let's end it off with just. You know, give us your words of wisdom of how do you determine product vision or a word of advice uh, on how to set product direction in general. Aha, they had us fooled. This is actually a product question, not an engineering question. <laughs> Why doesn't Kyle go first? Because he's closer to product as well in what he does. Could you repeat the question once for me, please? Sorry. Uh so how do you determine product vision? Do users know what they want? Can you build good software? Right. Yeah. Got yeah. I think early, it's it, early stages, it's almost all int intuition driven. And I think it's more like the Steve Jobs model of like, you ask somebody what they want, they're gonna say a faster horse, uh, not, uh, or the, sorry, that's Henry Ford. You, anyway, point being, there's a lot of people you can draw on for inspiration from this. And I think you have to have trust in whoever is the product owner and you have to have a product owner. And, and like, it, it has to be okay for somebody to make that decision. And then it's a question of like, how do you visualize it? How do you communicate it? How do you validate it? But as you go and your hypothesis gets played out, there's a lot of frameworks that you can use. And that could be like crowdsourcing from the team, which is one that I've used that's very effective where you're getting the team to submit their ideas together. You're sort of rack ranking them or doing so from your users is ultimately where you want to get to, right? That's the early stage approach. Um, I think in the later stage approach, it's like, you know, you got sort of a machine product managers and, you know, project managers and engineering managers who kind of come together, talk to the execs. But uh, my favorite pro process is that early stage process where it's leaving sort of like the founder's intuition and going into the hands of the team. And the team is then driving the product roadmap and you're using something like an ice score to try to, you know, calibrate what you think is going to be the highest impact and then layering in that user feedback on top of it. Because when you get there, you really know the team understands the customer, understands the mission, understands um, it. And you can use that as a really clear way to like un figure out, you know, how well aligned is everybody around this goal? I think that's like one of those magical times uh, in a business, especially like kind of coming to the end of product market fit um, or well, you know, if that ever ends. Um, but I, I think it's a, it's a really important concept for engineers to get strong at. And, and I've never really thought of it as like product and engineering in my life. I was just like, I'm building products. So I didn't, I, it was, it's a new concept to me to the idea that you separate these two worlds because I just always was building products, thinking about them through a product lens, but using software engineering or software development as a way of manifesting them. So 
Um, I don't, I, I'd like to hear what other people think as far as like these organizations that are, pro there's probably more of a delineation because I think when it's all kind of combined, it, it flows in a way that's very, uh, has a lot less mechanics to it. I, uh, like, I think in general, if you can get people that know multiple fields, they're, they're like 10 times more valuable. Like, I, I you know, the 10, 10, 10 X engineer thing I've heard is like, if you're hiring someone for like, uh, a startup, like for a startup engineer, and they know product and engineering, they're a 10x engineer. If you're hiring someone that's a designer and they know front end development and design, you know, they're 10 times faster than an individual designer and an individual front end person. So, a really easy way to upgrade your skills and get jobs if you're, you know, an early stage developer is, uh, you know, find some other field that is related to engineering and then sell the package because you'll be much better at two things, then you'll be at one thing. I think there's even an XKCD on this where it's like, it's so much easier to be the best in aggregate at two different fields than it is to be like the best chess player. Like you can be the best in aggregate chess player and rollerblader without a huge amount of effort, but it's really, really difficult to be the world's best chess player or the world's best rollerblader. So like as a startup founder, specifically a technical founder, having product and engineering makes you a really good technical founder. Um, but like, you know, it's hard to find people that have both of those skills reliably. So I think that's why there's a dichotomy there. The unicorn, an engineer who's learned how to sell. That, that's, I mean, I think that's the extreme of that example, right? And I've had to step into a sales role quite a bit in my business. And one of the things I think it's done is dramatically change how I think about software development. And I don't know that I like everything I see, but <laughs> I can say it's very much changed and created a ton of empathy for me with the needs of the business uh, in ways that I never experienced before. I, I really stretched myself there. Awesome. That's all we've got time for today. We've got maybe one minute left. So any last words of wisdom? Someone want to take this? Uh, don't solve solve problems. If you're interested, talk to me about it. I can help you take the shortcuts. <laughs> okay. Any yeah, other one liners? Good. Go ahead. And use deep source if you want to write good code. <laughs> All right. Hashtag shameless plug. <laughs> As of Kyle's throw, hiring. I'll, yeah, I'll, th I'll throw two things out. One, Drew Houston says, don't worry about failure. You only have to be right once. Uh, and yes, we're hiring. So come check.